All righty. All right. Three, two, one, record. Thank you for joining us oh, for the Pet Cag Podcast. I, I got an error. Always glad. It's always oh glad. <laughs> I got an error. What do you want me to do? Step into my office. Why? Because you're fired. Hello, my friends. Thank you for joining us for the Pep Cag Podcast, a weekly information security show featuring some all around good people. It is week 13 of 2022. I'm Chris Louie, and I'm still recovering from the smelling salts from last week's one-year anniversary episode. With me, I have my co-host, Brian Deach, who hits the smelling salt for fun now. You know, speaking of odd smells, like, what's up with hand sanitizer right now? I know what KY jelly and Patron smells like. I think there's something up. You gotta quit mixing the two, Brian. Have you not smelt uh, <laughs> hand sanitizer recently? <laughs> Uh, depends well, who depends makes it. Depends on the brand, I guess. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Anywhere I go, like any store, it's just like, I, this is KY Jelly and Patron. I guarantee it. I'm going to send you guys some. You must be getting it from, uh, from was that, uh, distilleries that are converted to making that stuff. Is that is that a real thing? Yeah. Oh, okay, that's why it, it smells yeah. like Patron then. Yeah. 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 The process to make sanitizer is not that different than the process to distill alcohol. Now, the KY jelly, I don't know what, I didn't know KY jelly had a distinct smell, and you're the only one that knows that. It's the, so. it's the you know, it's the weight of it, right? You just you just can kind of feel it's kind of slick, it just, it just rubs the in, you know what I'm saying. Viscosity. <laughs> All right, on that note, we also have Glenn Medina getting his tan on, not in a car with smelling salts this week. Yeah. Hey, everyone, welcome back, and thanks for joining us. It's episode 53, and I haven't been kicked off the show yet. I'm on PTO this week, as uh, Chris mentioned, and uh, in Southern California, and it's really beautiful down here. How could you complain about this sun? Deech can complain about the sun in, in the summer where he's at. That's true. This is the SPF well, 100 all the time. That's because it's already 100 degrees and it's only February over there. Yeah. Actually, it's a nice chilly day. It's like 75 out. Birds are chirping. Leaves are still falling. It's fall. It's fall in Arizona. March 3rd or 8th or whatever day it is today. I don't even know anymore. <laughs> what year is it? Who's president? It's it's a third year of 2020. <laughs> okay. <laughs> this week we have Kushagra Mehra, who has been a longtime listener and a first-time caller. So thanks for joining us on the show. Welcome, Kush. Would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah. Thanks for having me on, guys. Um, I've been wearing various hats over the years. Everything from support and operations, a brief stint in marketing, and then a few years in SE. Um, it's all been on deception, though. I'd been advocating on deception, zero trust, like since back in university. And, well, lo and behold, a few years later, I find myself at Smokescreen. Met uh, Sahir and the team that you had on a couple of episodes ago. Met them at a conference. A few years passed by after that and joined Zscaler as, uh, during the acquisition. So things lined up, I suppose. Yeah, it's great to have you on. And you were at Smokescreen for a, a number of years. So you you were, what employee number were you at Smokescreen, I guess? Uh, that's a good question. I think it was somewhere around like 10 or 12 or something. I don't know the exact one offhand. Thanks. Yeah, so you joined pretty early on. Started at the yeah, bottom, now we here. SP City is employee number four. Yeah. <laughs> so do you yeah. have quite the track record that, uh, that uh, what was it? SP. Uh, SP. SP, yeah. Do you have his track record or? Uh, I don't think anybody that? has SP's track record. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I think uh, yeah. we have. I, I don't know if you guys know. There's this famous uh, actor in Bollywood called Amitabh Bachchan, and one of our clients uh, once referred to him as like the Amitabh Bachchan of cybersecurity. And I'm trying to think of like who a good counterpart is, like a well-known celebrity who like is a household name for everyone, no matter the generation. And I can't think of one in Hollywood. Tom Cruise. No. Tom Cruise. Tom Cruise. Yeah, Brad I suppose. Pitt. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean, people get yeah, me so confused probably... with those guys all the time. <laughs> oh yeah, especially of Brad Pitt. I might take you my mean... shirt off. Uh, David, David Hasselhoff, Hoff. <laughs> <laughs> the Hoff. Yeah, the younger generation knows about him because of SpongeBob. He was in the SpongeBob movie, I think. That's true. Who was the Hoff? David Hasselhoff. Oh, the Hoff yeah. was in SpongeBob. Look, yeah. now, did, you almost had me looking for Brian. Combined, we have decades of information security experience and here not just to educate, but to entertain. We've got four awesome stories for you this week, so sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. For our opening topic, our Russia-Ukraine story of the week, 
supposedly Ukraine killed four Russian generals in their stalling invasion of Ukraine. This happened when one of the generals was killed when he used a SIM card to place a phone call over a 2G cellular network, and the Ukrainian resistance was able to trace the call, locate the general, and assault his location. Typically, generals do not get so close to the front lines, but due to the sinking morale, Putin allegedly ordered his generals closer to the action as a morale booster. In the first two weeks of Russia's invasion into Ukraine, they lost more soldiers than the U.S. did during their 20-plus years in Iraq and Afghanistan, and there are a few theories of why Russian generals are using 2G SIM cards to communicate with Moscow. So number one, Russia lacks secure communications capabilities. Number two, no one told the military they would be mobilizing so quick and they did not have time to roll it out. Number three, someone has been taking the money meant for secure comms and buying yachts and football clubs. Number four, the Russian military never tested their equipment on a hostile cellular network. Or number five, the Ukrainian cellular network has been degraded to the point where they just cannot use their secure comms. I say all of the above. Can you imagine the guy that like the little nerd sitting in the sock? He's like, dude, there's no way you won't you will not believe this guy. There is a <laughs> there's a five star general like right down the street and now communicating with this 2G SIM. Let's go blow it up. They're like, no, nah, you're lying. There's no way that could happen. That's that's incredible. <laughs> I'm thinking like about the guys living the high life, you know, like buying football clubs and yachts and whatnot. Like yeah, while I... one some poor general is like duking it out in Ukraine, getting bombs on his head. <laughs> yeah, because he has to resort to 2G cellular <laughs> networks. Well, you think he's probably going here like, man, I sure wish I was on that yacht that I took the money from to for this uh for this comms and now he realizes he's sitting in the middle of a of a hostile zone and not able to communicate because he was actually the one that stole the money. So so do you, do you th- well hold on do you think that they're actually like tapping the audio like they're like oh this is the general or do you think he like accidentally like the phone he was using he's making a phone call that was all legit from the background there was a Facebook and YouTube video and they're like oh wait a second this is uh so and so this is how we know definitively it's him I think they intercepted the call I I I would tend to believe they intercepted the call listened in and said oh this is a pretty high ranking guy they might have even reference him by name. Uh, I think it's because cellular, by definition, is not encrypted. It's it's all in the clear. It's easy to intercept. Ukraine controls the cell towers, so intercepting it should be trivial to them. Yeah, I, yeah, I, I don't think any. Yeah, I don't think any of our communications is ever secure. Period. Right. I mean, you can look That's at what it from, the secure comms are for. Yeah, secure comms. I would. I, I would highly. Uh, secure comms are only as secure as the person that's listening to them as well. Right. And so, I. I would highly think that all this stuff is entirely um, breachable, right? Secure comms. I mean, someone's gonna someone's gonna squawk and they go, "Oh, there's a secure comm." Then they're gonna go, "Hey, from an op standpoint, we can't break it, but we know we can triangulate where that connection's coming from." That may even give further further um, reference to where the person is or where they are. Yeah, I think that's probably it, you know. They probably have, like, they know the areas they don't have control over right now. They can just triangulate any signals coming out of that, anyone connecting to those areas. Yeah. I, I th- if they had cellular capability, they could just, like, pull up the Signal app or the Telegram app or the WhatsApp app and then use that. That's end-to-end encrypted. You can make encrypted phone calls using these apps, but I think they're cell network is just so degraded they have to resort to to 2g they have no more data maybe yeah. in that area I, I was watching some videos and this goes back to kind of the whole you know uh, preparedness or readiness right so when when i was in the military you know we 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 rotated the tires we changed the tires we did we did all kinds of things right and you feel like man that's a perfectly good tire there's that's still good and one of the they one of the things they talked about was you know all these vehicles that are getting abandoned because they're make they're trying to make it through the mud, and these tires in general haven't been rotated or haven't been replaced or if they have been replaced it's a cheaper grade or model of tire not ready for you know the extreme weather conditions or you know the ex- extreme conditions of 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 trying to in, in combat, so I can only imagine you know as we talk about you know money being swept away for other things. 
that the devices or the equipment that the Russians have probably haven't been maintained. They, they're, they're low on cash and they're not like, oh, that tire looks good, but that tire is actually like two years old, right? So I know that's one of the things that they had talked about, why Russia hasn't been successful. Yeah. Or no one charged the batteries for their satellite phones. They're yeah. all dead. Yeah, or, or even stress tested their secure comms, right? So, speaking yeah, of how bad do things have to be that you can't go to satellite? Things got to be how pretty bad, bad. Did, yeah, pretty but, bad, yeah. That or smoke signals, hmm, hmm, mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, ah, doves, cool. Morse, Dove. Morse code. Yeah. Pig- Let's roll out some telegraph lines, pigeons. Did you, <laughs> <laughs> did you guys ever see the uh, in, intimidate or intimidation game? All right, I'm imitation talking. game, imitation game, yeah, like the one where it was like, I think it was like Alan. Turing? Turing. Turing. Yeah, he was breaking yeah. Yeah. Uh, the cipher that was used for, for all of the uh, Hitler's communications. Do you, guys, do you guys recall like the key word that helped them hone in on that? Heil Hitler. Uh, Heil I, Hitler, yeah. I, right. yeah I, I, know, I know the story, yeah. It, was, it wasn't like they open it with the weather and they always end with Heil Hitler. Yeah. Yep. yep. That's exactly it. Pretty cool how you can uh, reverse engineer stuff, right? So yeah, going back to... Uh, Glenn's point, right? It's it's only as good as you know the people that are using it, right? And the the thoughts and actions behind it. Because time, yeah, right? time will tell. Yeah, time will tell whether or not this. Uh, this well, remember when we had Eric Persh on? He was telling us about the enemies messing with their communications and how important it is. It, it'll be interesting to see if if this really would have turned the tide of battle. If if they're if they were able to scale the communicate and coordinate movements, would things have turned out different? Or were they just you know, woefully unprepared for this level of resistance? I mean, the other side of it, too, is like someone may have been providing Ukraine with sophisticated eavesdropping equipment, right? More so than than what your normal average would be, right? Possibly. And you, you mean an unnamed Western country that might be feeding them some... <laughs> Some uh, you like China sophisticated equipment. Yeah, may not be able to provide <laughs> planes, but something really good. Yeah, open source intelligence. There you go. Hey, they always said like the next the next war, right, is gonna be around information gathering, not so much as boots on the ground, right? That's actually this war. I, I was gonna say this is actually this would make a good topic for another podcast. But how the tide has changed with with open source intelligence gathering, like Telegram and. Google Maps, like knowing where the red marks, red roads are on Google Maps, that's where you know there's like a refugee convoy or something just using these open source intelligence tools. It's 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 amazing. It's amazing good and amazing bad of of how much information is out there. What I did Apple really... and Google say they're shutting it down. Yeah, they Sorry. were. Yes. Yes, that's that's exactly why they had to shut it down was because Russia was using it to find out where the refugee movements were. But like, so let's talk strategy, right? Like if you're Putin, like, what was he thinking? Is this like, hey, you know that road that goes from Russia to Ukraine? We're just going to send all of our crap over there on that one road that bridges the two countries together. Like, to me, it doesn't seem like very much, you know, thinking went behind that. Yeah, then you get like a 300 situation where you know, 300 people with spears and shields can block this this entire country from coming in. It's probably just going for, you know, uh, optics more than actual effectiveness. Like, look at this huge army coming after you, you know, and That's hopefully you get optics. intimidated. <laughs> yeah. That's really bad yeah. optics. Yeah. <laughs> it was, and yet it doesn't work out. <laughs> yeah. That's like a bluff that went bad. So, so yeah, t- exactly. Kush, from your perspective, right, like the way that you're learn- uh, you learn this information being in a whole other country, how's the information presented to you? Do you see it for, through the sem- same lens of the U.S.? Like, you know, Russia's getting their, their butts kicked right here and they're losing a lot of people or are you seeing it differently? Yeah, more or less. I, I think most of the world outside of like Russia and allied states, I, I suppose that's just where it is. But um, pretty much everyone is seeing it as, irrespective of how you see the justification for the war, everyone's seeing it as Russia getting their butt kicked right now. Do, but do, you, see, that's do you see sentiment as well from, from, from folks in India that like, what is Russia thinking? Like, why are they doing this? Um, I, I don't think everyone has enough of an awareness of, you know, the geopolitical issues. I mean, this is especially, it's not just Russia's backyard, right? It's become a bit of a NATO or the West versus Russia thing. And in India, the awareness about that level of history is, I mean, it's not very prevalent. It's present, but it's not very prevalent. There's more of a moral outrage of uh, 
I, I heard some folks um, just when the war kicked off and India voted to abstain. Um, didn't, we didn't vote to, I think, uh, what is the vote on? Condemning the invasion? I think it was the uh, Security Council. Yeah, the UN Security yeah. Council vote. I think India abstained. Yeah, that. so I remember folks being kind of stunned that, you know, this is a blatant act of aggression. How can we morally not come out explicitly against it? But, yeah, I guess there's there's the government position and then there's the citizens position because the government position, like I think India is still buying oil from Russia. You know, most of the Western countries, including the U.S., has boycotted that. So I think there's a government position, but then there's also the citizens uh, position as well. Yeah, and more than just energy. I mean, energy is a factor. We're also buying a lot of military equipment from them. Uh, most of our fighter jets, for example, have been coming from them over the decades. So... Yeah, India's got a pretty large army, right? If I if I, if I recall, top three? No, um, I don't know the exact ranking, but yeah, it's pretty high up there. I mean, we got a billion people, so we got people irrespective. Sorry, my my three hundred twenty million <laughs> don't count. Yeah. <laughs> All right, uh, for our first uh, first story, the Lapis Ransomware Group has really been on a roll lately. They claim responsibility for the hack against NVIDIA, which we talked about, I think, on last week's or two weeks ago. And we have two breaking stories now that Lapis may have breached Microsoft Azure's development environment, which was actually confirmed this morning with an initial data dump. It's about 37 gigs, including some source code for Bing and for Cortana. So we know Google is quivering, quivering in their boots right now. And just today, they also posted screenshots of sensitive information belonging to Okta, the identity provider and single sign-on software vendor. Okta has put out an official statement to the SEC. So in the U.S., we have the Securities and Exchange Commission. And if there's information material to the stock price or to the company, they have to report to the SEC. They put out a report that's saying in January, one of their subcontractors was breached and the screenshots of that are of that breach back in January and that they did not hack Okta proper, but an investigation will tell. The downside of this, like if you work in technology, is like even though you weren't directly impacted, like the, the street's going to react on, on, you know, upon that, right? So any ba- any news against any cloud security company is going to have a detrimental effect against us all, I believe. And by the way, couldn't they just dump the source code for Zoom? That would have been awesome. Why, well, you want to make your own Zoom client? I mean... Why not? Let's bring it back. Let's raise the dead. Give Apple a run for their money. Just kidding. That thing was terrible. Oh, the Zoom. I thought you said Zoom. No. The Zoom. <laughs> yeah, not Zoom. The successful media player, you know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, we, uh, I wonder if those are worth anything. Brian, you've got the Bing source code, so you could get started on something against Google. Take Google down before you take Apple down. Uh, all it is is a curl command that scrapes Google. <laughs> And then returns the, the results. <laughs> <laughs> Done. Check. That'd be funny if they actually dug into the Bing source code and there's all these references to Google in there. There was at one point in time when, when Bing first came out, a lot of the results were like identical going back and forth between what you get with Google versus Bing. And I think there was some, some type of lawsuit against that. We have to dig that, dig that one up, though. Could you imagine if one of the references is uh, stolen from Chrome? Or from from Google inside there. Yeah. Like an actual like code was inside there. It's like, hey, this was actually there. Before. Yeah, there's just like a comment. A developer put that comment. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but Lapis, for being relatively unknown up until now, now they're hitting all these really high profile targets. I I believe Lapis was also responsible for Samsung, so that's might be four yep. actually really high profile targets. Uh, Lapis is a little different. They're they may or may not ransomware you. They're more of the data theft business, which is a little, is, I guess it's better for them because people are actually looking for ransomware. They're not looking for data theft as much. And you know, when, once you start ransomwareing people, then that tips your hand that you're in the network. But their, their ransom demands have been, you know, pay us money or we're going to release your source code or we're going to embarrass your company and release these embarrassing emails. So they're taking a different approach to ransomware. Or with NVIDIA, you know, where they demanded change in policy, like open source your, I think it was driver source code, and uh, yeah, take off yeah. your... Yeah, so remove the cap. Yep. Yeah. Take remove off the, the mining cap. cap. So the downside of this... Yeah, they're fighting for you, the <coughs> cryptocurrency miners. Yeah. The downside, right, is like, it, like, let's say, I don't know how big Bing really is or Cortana, 
But I mean, you jump the source code that gives everyone the ability to start poking around, look for vulnerabilities, right? So that could be bad news across the board, especially with their market share. Not no, not necessarily in search, but on endpoint for sure. Yeah, and Azure as well. If it gives them hints on how Azure works, because it was an Azure development account that got breached allegedly, so they can get into Azure and find some of the bugs there. Then that that could potentially be hazardous for Azure customers. I'm curious how you do 37 gigs worth of exfil. Do you think they did it over DNS? Do you think they did over uh, SSL and TLS? What do you guys think? How, well, number one, how do they even get in? Did you even talk about that yet? Whether it's Okta or Microsoft. I don't think so. Okta allegedly it was through a subcontractor. So I think they hacked the subcontractor to try to go upstream, but I don't think they made it upstream. I wouldn't be surprised if it, the same thing happened with Microsoft. They, they hacked, hacked a data processor or a third party contractor and got in that way. The old, the old target breach route. You mean through it, through the HVAC uh, system of sorts? Yeah. Aquarium? No. Oh, yeah, that was the, talk- the hotel, right? That was the casino. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Although when we talked about like T-Mobile, when T-Mobile got hacked through an open telnet on, port on a router and they got like 100 gigs of data, like, it's it's amazing. Like You could just upload something to Dropbox or OneDrive and a lot of these organizations wouldn't know. So I mean, I think you might be giving them way too much credit using DNS tunneling or uh, a TLS connection out. Just pipe this thing out and throw it in Bitbucket or a paste bin and, and these companies might not even know if they have no visibility into that. That's why you got to do data protection correctly and you got to do sandboxing correctly and you got to do micro segmentation correctly it's it's achievable right i have customers that do it all the time yeah it's like an ogre you got to do it in layers (laughs) layers i don't get the reference but i'll laugh (laughs) you don't you don't get it no oh your your kids are shrek oh i I can never make it through kids movies i always fall asleep man so, Kush, what's your take on this from a deception standpoint? So, NVIDIA, Samsung, Microsoft, and Okta all allegedly got breached. How would you think of it from a deception or active defense standpoint? I mean, more than anything else, the way I'm thinking about this is, you know, what are your crown jewels, right? I'm pretty sure Microsoft, I mean, as much as we poke fun at it, I'm pretty sure Microsoft values the Bing source code quite a bit, right? Uh, the same goes for Kodan and the rest of it. Why don't you just like ring fence at least your most critical assets more aggressively? Whatever uh, defenses you may have for everything else, whatever monitoring you may have, and that's not to say they haven't done it. But I'd, I'd be a little surprised that you know you, you can exfiltrate thirty seven gigs out of Microsoft and nobody knows. Right? I, I mean, I sure, think if you, I mean if you, you you think about the sheer volume, right? They have like you know over one hundred and seventy, hundred, two hundred thousand employees, and another twice as many contractors. And the amount of bandwidth that they're probably piping through their technology, through their their network, it's probably huge. So, thirty five gigs really it's a drop in a bucket for them. I think it is. Yeah, but again, um, sure from the organization. Yeah, but from your Bing development environment or from your Azure development yeah. environment, how often do you have thirty seven gigs going out? Oh. that's probably where I monitor right. Monitor yeah, closer yeah. to the crown jewels. Yeah. yeah. And like I said, I think I, I you guys would agree as well. I mean, I don't do SSL decryption is key, right? You got to know who's coming in and out on those on those uh, those secure ports. So much secure ports, right? So could you imagine if they leaked that out onto OneDrive and then from OneDrive out that way? <laughs> That'd be hilarious. That's what I think they must have done. <laughs> yeah, that's what I'm thinking. I'm like, if you keep it in house, like if you go from an Azure development environment to SharePoint or to OneDrive, that might not raise as many bells as uploading it to Pastebin or, or Box.com. Because I, I remember a number of years ago, there was a, a pretty famous Minecraft server and it was always trying to get taken down. So they put it behind Cloudflare, they put it behind Akamai and all this DDoS protection stuff. And then the attackers got clever. They found out which data center hosted this Minecraft server, bought a server or rented a server inside this data center and then started DDoSing it from the inside. So it's, it's, it's like, you're always thinking of the attacker coming from the outside, but you also have to think about, you know, what's coming in from, from the inside. That's where we, uh, I mean, in with deception, that's what you're thinking about, right? Where you're like, I don't care where the guy comes from. The f- I care about where you're going. You're, you're still going to this particular 
repository. Sure, I'll stand up a decoy code repository. I'll have decoy passwords on like my developer systems and so on. In fact, there was one we did last year for a customer where they had exactly this use case. They were concerned that the development environment was compromised. Like we can't do your entire organization in a weekend. You suspect there's already compromised. Let's just go where the attack, where you suspect the attack might be. That's probably the best way to approach it, especially it, when you're short on time. Is this a surprise to you, Kush, that that companies these lar- this large can are, are these these big are still getting owned and and data exfiltrated? Is, does it come as a surprise? It's it's got the shock value when you see the headline. But I mean, yeah. the moment you think about it for a second, you know, you realize like, sure, a large organization gives you a lot of resources to defend, but it also gives you so many potential attack points, right? It's it's kind of like protecting a city at that point. How many guards do you need to protect a city? Sure, you have a city's resources instead of, you know, just my backdoor that I need to guard. But how do you defend an entire city? How many guards? How do you be confident that nobody's missing anything? Well, just have your guards at the, the back door. <laughs> but you got the you got the front door, you got the back door, you got the side window. And then you have to worry about them parachuting in from from the sky, digging underneath, digging from underground. Like yeah, it's yeah. You, that's the old saying: you have to be right one hundred percent of the time. The attackers only have to be right once. Well, well, I mean that goes back to Ukraine, right? We can go back to Ukraine. We could talk about them driving down a road in single file line, and then mm-hmm. yeah, like I said, I was watching some of the videos as well where they actually had some Russian implanted within the cities as well that were causing you know yeah. their own little chaos right so those are maybe and then they you had guys trying to arrest those folks so that was this deception technology working on the back end right trying to find the guys you know the russian implants so that's why i suggest deception where you know it's it's not so much i mean do it with honeypots if you with open source honeypots if you must but if you have deception, you don't have to be right 100% of the time. The attacker has to be right 100% of the time. They trip up once and, yeah. you know, that works to the defender's favor. Very true. It's you a lot f- easier. You flip the script on them, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you're, you're being asked to play by an unfair set of rules and, like, why play by those rules, right? Just refuse to play that <laughs> yeah. game. It's even the playing field. Agreed. All right, well, related to the first story, our next story is a tale of hacking back. And it's emerged that in the Lapis versus NVIDIA saga, apparently the Lapis gang enrolled one of their VMs into NVIDIA's MDM solution or mobile device management solution as a way to breach the network. Well, the Lapis team forgot that this VM was enrolled and NVIDIA took control of it and used it as a beachhead to get into Lapis's network. So they effectively hacked them back. NVIDIA allegedly encrypted the VM and all the stolen data in a true Mr. Robot fashion. Lapis claims to have made a copy of the data, so even though it was encrypted, they still have the data and are threatening to release it. Now, I think it's hilarious that NVIDIA actually hacked them back, but was it legal? In this case, I think it was because Lapis enrolled their devices into NVIDIA's MDM solutions. They're bound by the terms of the organization and NVIDIA can nuke it if they want to. It'd be a different story if NVIDIA used their red teaming tools to hack into Lapis unsolicited. 100% legal. Good for them. Do it again, guys. Bravo. Yeah, the Lapis gang basically said, here's my VM, please administer it to let me in. Like, okay, I'll administer it to do other stuff too. <laughs> Would have been hilarious if like, the NVIDIA team just went and started encrypting everything else at Lapis, right? And just started going... <laughs> Going east west and started doing more damage than what Lapis had done to Nvidia. You, I think that's what they did allegedly. I think I think they used this VM to get into their their network or whatever the VM was connected to. Uh, that might not be legal. I mean, you guys would know better about uh, uh, the saying the CFAA. But from what I understand, the CFAA you could get into some serious trouble if you explicitly hack back. The fact that they joined them to Nvidia's MDM sort of gives Nvidia license, right? They're technically owners of this VM now. Okay, I'm gonna ask. A, yeah. I'm gonna ask a real dumb question. Do you guys really think Lapis is gonna to go to the FBI and go, "Hey, Nvidia <laughs> hacked us"? <laughs> Who are they gonna call? I mean, they were dumb enough to get their shit enrolled. So yeah. there's that. Sorry, Chris, you have to edit uh, that. Let me rephrase it. They apparently go ahead and say. Uh, then again, they did enroll their device into in, into Nvidia's stuff. So. And, 
do dumb things, all right? You're going to get dumb prizes. This is one of them. But how, how crazy is it? Like, these dudes were able to hack NVIDIA and, and Okta and Microsoft, and this is the thing that they got them. Yeah, one of the things, they, they forgot to unenroll the VM or destroy the VM. It's yeah, they had to dumb. enroll it yeah. to access the VPN, from what I understand. That's apparently NVIDIA's requirement. Yeah. Uh, okay, that makes more sense. I do remember in, uh, I think it was David Clark's books, someone wrote a book about Mandiant, and there was a story about Mandiant hacking back the Chinese PLA, the People's Liberation Army, their their cyber security front. And uh, I, I heard that Mandiant could have gotten into a whole lot of trouble, you know, based on the testimonies in this book. But I think, Glenn, like you said, I don't think the Chinese government is going to launch a formal complaint against Mandiant about illegally hacking into them. I mean, really, what is yeah, illegal especially after, anymore? Yeah, who, who's going to report who in that situation? I see that Spider-Man comic coming up where they're just like pointing at each other. <laughs> yeah. like, you're <laughs> the bad guy. Everybody, do, do it real quick. Point yeah. to a square on, on your Zoom. <laughs> it's like, are we the baddies? Yeah. <laughs> uh, again, you're going to have to Google this term, Elastic Man. Baddies is something what you probably don't think it is, but it, to our younger audience, it definitely is. <laughs> All right. Well, that's the old skit, right? When they were like, it was supposed to be the Nazis. Like, why do we have skulls on our caps? And you know, why are we rounding up and capturing people? Are, are we the bad guys? Are we the baddies? Like, do you know that that skit? Yeah, I think it's Monty Python, if I remember correctly. Yeah, yeah. I think the internet has just ruined me. I think, that, I think that's what the guys <laughs> in Russia are starting to realize. <laughs> it's like, are we the bad guys? <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I will I will look that up. If it is something hilarious, I'll link it in. It's all right, to, you know. Okay, nothing okay. nothing too bad. Okay. Okay. Yeah, that, that must be like foreign slang or something. All right, we're good. TikTok slang, right? All right. <laughs> uh, for our next topic, in some good news this week, the Italian government has officially joined Troy Hunt's Have I Been Pwned service. They are the 29th national government to do so. And for those of you unfamiliar with this service, Have I Been Pwned? It's a free service online where you can enter your email address or your phone number and see if your data has appeared in any data breaches. For me, my personal email, I've had it since 2005, and I type it into the website, and I've appeared in 30 separate data breaches and five online dumps. So my online identity is totally compromised. How many of them were Adobe? governments would want to be... Sorry. More reason to go where? I said, no. How many of those breaches yeah, were Adobe? Adobe? No, really? Uh, I was not part of the Adobe one. So I can say there were some crypto-related ones. Dropbox, Evite, Home Chef, LinkedIn, MGM, MySpace, Patreon, Ticketfly, Zynga, just to name a few. So I, are you trying to list off all of them that you were compromised in or just the entire list? Because it sounds like you've been literally <laughs> a part of every single uh, Amway scheme ever. <laughs> he left out Ashton yeah, Madison. No, those are... I think it's because he, uses... <laughs> he uses his email to sign up for everything, every free service there is. So Yeah, those, those are the ones that I was in. And I didn't even read all, all 30 of them. Those are the ones, the more well-known ones. There are some like third-party advertising ones that nobody would have heard of. Everyone uses them. No he was definitely an Ashley Madison, of. guys. Guarantee it. <laughs> yeah. Just kidding. Just you can type it in. You guys know my personal email. <laughs> <laughs> well, the reason governments would want to be uh, interested in this data is to see if their employees appeared in any data breaches. So, for example, if I'm a U.S. government employee and I use my government email address for a service that gets breached, more often than not, users will reuse their passwords. So the password that somebody used on Adobe and Adobe gets breached, that's the same password I'm going to be using for my government uh, account. That means these data breaches of private websites could leak, lead to breaches into government systems. And we actually saw this since you guys mentioned it. We saw it during the Ashley Madison leaks and the hacks. This is the website for infidelity. It was strictly for, for that reason. And there were people signing up with their website, like at FBI.gov, at you know, USStateDepartment.gov. Uh, so people using their actual government accounts on these sites, and it's likely that they reuse their password. 
So it's good that the governments are now monitoring these breaches to reset people's passwords or let them know that they've been breached. How is it the bad guys have better OPSEC than us? You know, we've right got, ones, we've got the good guys like, yeah, okay, fair enough. It's the lowest common denominator at work. Have you seen some of these people? What's funny is I've, I, I went to the Have I Been Pwned and I typed in my phone number, nothing, right? Type in my personal email. There's stuff on here I've never even used. I'm like, how on earth did I, like, Poshmark? I don't even know what the heck that is. Mathway? Like, these are things that I never would have used. Poshmark is that clothing reselling service, I think. Did you buy like a used Gucci belt or something at some point? Uh, I have I have retail Gucci money. Excuse me, sir. Come on now. <laughs> What's Gucci, by the way? <laughs> it's pretty good, though. That so Gucci you know? is... I know that term, Brian. So Gucci means something is good. Yes. Like, that's Gucci. So I, I'm familiar with that one. On that topic, though, there's, it's actually quite a good thing that they've got uh, tons of these folks doing automatic lookups. And they, I think I saw in the post that they're like the 29th government to join this. Yes, yes. So they are number 29, which is good. I don't know if the U.S. is on it, but I know like the U.K. and Australia, I believe, are yep. part of it. And I think it's a good thing. It's, this is a really good service. He does it for free. The, the op completely open source. I remember a while ago, he had there was a fork in the road. Like he could get acquired. He could go public and sell it. Um, or he could open source it. He chose to open source it, which he's, it's good. I mean, this, this, this is a positive thing for the internet. I bought and a, it's not something small. I was going to say, I, I bought a domain a long time ago, like pre like Y2K, I think. Anyways, the guy I bought it from still uses like this, this like default email address sometimes. And so I get like insurance quotes and stuff sent to it i'm like dude can you stop <laughs> or i'll get like his uh his credit check he'll, he'll use it like i don't know what he's thinking he's just like yep that, this is my email address does he like, get a password default to your system and sometimes you reset yeah. all his accounts <laughs> i've had like <laughs> rental agreements cool. come in right like he's, yeah he, he's on the, on the east coast and he's got some pretty nice properties and he's like literally people are sending freaking like uh like housing applications right like social security number and everything to me i'm like what the heck is going on here man you gotta stop awesome. and i call him he's like yeah i forgot sorry <laughs> that's good it's a good thing you're one of the good guys brian you should tell him it's gonna cost you a thousand dollars every time i don't think he would even care <laughs> he's shopping for new insurance right now though. there's that or play the long game you know use this as a way to like keep sending things to brian until he bites on something. It'll take like 25 years, yeah. but someday Brian will bite on something that I, <laughs> yeah. and get some of his information. He'll, he'll, click on, he'll click on something bad. And then get that sweet Gucci money. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, he's, like, he's trying to sign up with like an Amazon.com account. I'm like, come on, man. I just give up already. It won't validate his... Yeah, anyways, go on. Yeah, I actually do that because I, I also have a... I wouldn't say popular, but... When Outlook came out, Outlook.com, and they had free emails uh, through, uh, through Microsoft, like they had no input validation whatsoever. They had no restrictions on what you could use as your email address. So there were people out there registering like customer service at Outlook.com or help at Outlook.com, and you could legitimately own this. So I actually went in and I grabbed one that was probably inappropriate, so I can't say it on, on the, the podcast here. They didn't filter it out, uh, but I do get weird emails coming to it. Uh, and for things like registrations and, you know, thank you for registering or, you know, you must verify your, your email address to post this comment. So I thought that was pretty funny. Yeah, someone got Steve Ballmer at Outlook.com back then. <laughs> <laughs> no way. <laughs> yeah, seriously, they had no filters cool. on that whatsoever. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah, that was that was a good way of not had not to roll out a service. But yeah, there are some pretty yeah. funny ones out there that I saw people are getting. All right, for our last topic, and it'll be a rotating topic every week, the day is almost here when we pour one out for our old friend, Internet Explorer, the browser commonly referred to as Internet Exploiter due to its enormous amount of vulnerabilities, or Internet Exploder because it crashed all the time. After Internet Explorer is retired, Microsoft will still support legacy Internet Explorer-based uh, websites and applications within their new browser, Microsoft Edge, via the built-in Internet Explorer mode feature. I actually commend Microsoft for actually killing off a piece of vulnerable software and not keeping it around for, quote, 
legacy reasons or backwards compatibility. If software cannot be made secure, it must be removed or mitigated, such as error gapping it. Pretty cool. So you're telling me no ActiveX now? No, I think it's there's still Thankfully, ActiveX. No more ActiveX. Yeah, no more ActiveX, <laughs> but within it, it sounds like Edge is going to support ActiveX within within the browser itself in IE mode. Does that sound right? Yeah, you gotta flip a preference flag and then restart your browser or something. Yeah. You can access the IE mode. So there is a new company, it's a startup, it's called Island, and they actually have support for Internet Explorer. Uh, it's coming around the corner soon, so a pretty cool, pretty cool feature. We'll say bye bye IE, hello Island. Yeah, yeah. And along with other security controls that you can have around that, so pretty cool. You guys should look it up, Island.io. Pretty cool company. <laughs> so was it uh, for IE? Was it always this ActiveX, Flash, and, and Java? Were those the three biggest pain points for them? Silverlight was in there as well too. Silverlight was also there. Yeah, yeah. Silverlight. Yeah. yeah. Damn. Do you remember who started out with Silverlight? Riverbed. I have no idea. The Netflix. Was it Netflix? Right? Wasn't it? I think it was Netflix. Yeah, that was the way that they could stream their videos. I and thought it was some, Microsoft. Some level of DRM on it. It was Microsoft, but I think Netflix is the one that really pushed it and continues development. Like. Oh yeah, early days, right? Yeah, it would have died on the wayside, but if it weren't for Netflix pushing it for for their streaming. Back when Quickster was a thing. Yeah. Do you know that there's a network taps out there that can take uh, like Netflix Netflix feeds and figure out what like actually what movie you're actually watching? So what do you do? You just pipe in the the address and it'll tell you what what the what the hash is specific to that movie. I, I I think so. What I, I what I had remember or recall talking to a, a college or university about it, uh, there I figured out I can't even remember exactly what what problem they were trying to solve, but it may have just been a spam port. They would just flood traffic over here, and then they have forensics or you know at least some historical stuff on like what the kids are watching in college as it pertained to Netflix. I thought it was pretty wild to be able to look, be able to fingerprint that. I, I would, what I would assume to be UDP traffic, right? I've never actually looked at it that, all that close. I think it'd be in the metadata at some point, the metadata would have to flow and that would have the name of the movie in it maybe, or some kind of identifier that they could reverse look up. Could it be in plain text though? Probably not but that that's simple. Not, but that's not, that's, that's 443 UDP data, right? It's HTTPS. Yeah. Yeah. So. That's pretty cool. Well, no, UDP doesn't have, doesn't support TLS, right? Because there's no handshake. So, what is this? Is it encapsulated within the the, the stream? Something else we got to go look into now. Yeah, I think we gave Brian a homework assignment. Go, go go find out. Yay me! How they're gonna fingerprint this? Yeah, you started right. it, Brian. All right, I'll figure it out and come back to you guys with like a detailed analysis, which means it'll probably be like three words or less. It's really cool. <laughs> Yeah, I remember this meme online that that I saw. Um, if you guys are familiar with Rick and Morty, uh, there's there's a meme that says, you know, Rick is talking to this robot and they pasted a, a picture of IE on it. And then the robot says, what is my function? And then Rick says, you download Chrome. Like, that was the only thing <laughs> IE was good for, was downloading Chrome or downloading a, an actual usable browser, Firefox, Brave, you know, pick your, yeah, that's, pick your browser. Yeah. So I've, got the, I've got the same story. Of like, what's the first thing you do when you open your Mac or your Windows device? You download, you download Chrome. Chrome. <laughs> you download Chrome. <laughs> so that is another thing, right? Do you guys use like Safari at all, Net, uh, Firefox, or just strictly Chrome? I know, you know, obviously if you have a bad <laughs> browser like Island, you'd be using that all the time. But for me, I, I kind of, it's like work is Chrome, personal is is Firefox. What do you guys do? I've so got I, yeah, purpose go specific browsers. Yeah, I've got like, uh, I've got Chrome for, you know, uh, at work, I've got Chrome for customer demos. I've got Firefox for other stuff. Safari is like occasionally for help and support articles. But everything has a function, even on my personal machine. Do you use like Brave because of the privacy side of it or? Uh, not so much because, not I mean, so I've much. got Firefox for that. Um, okay. And Brave is just another Chromium. Yeah. 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 I use Brave primarily for everything. Firefox when I need to 
do something in an environment where I don't want something personal popping up. But yeah, that's that's isolated there. And then Safari, I actually use on my iOS device, so iPad and, and iPhone. I still use this built-in Safari browser. Yeah, I, I was a big Chrome user, and then I switched to Island, which is based off of Chromium. Um, but like I said, and then I, I was a long time for forever, I was on Firefox and just realized that Firefox was only good because it allowed me to circumvent proxy settings. So um, no, I don't do proxy settings anymore. It doesn't really matter. <laughs> so, I, w- yeah, I, was I think this... I would use Brave if I, ha- if I didn't have to rely on compatibility for, you know, the application I need to demo or something like that then I'd go much more down to my personal preference. Now it's just less work, less work for the devs if I just say, I'm on Chrome. This is what I need you to fix. So so there's a second question yeah. behind that, right? Is what do you guys use for a search engine? Well, DuckDuckGo. Yeah. DuckDuckGo. There you go. Is, is there it. another one out there? I don't even know. Um, yeah, there's a couple. <laughs> only it's even a question. <laughs> you know, maybe our listeners use Bing. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Ask Jeeves. <laughs> I still use Jeeves with the, the butler holding the, the tray of drinks. Alta Vista? Did, yeah. Do you remember when Bing used to give money? Or is it Bing? Bing used to yeah, give us like, yeah, Bing, Bing bucks, points. right? Yes. Yeah. He has points. Yeah. You get Microsoft points that way. Yeah. And you could trade those for Xbox cards and whatnot. Yeah. You could buy, what, the Zoom with it? I don't know. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> Closing the loop on it. Hey, did you guys notice? So I was actually this close to moving to Safari because. One day I was like farting around on my phone and then I opened up my iPad and it was just like, hey, you know, take this page that you're reading on your iPhone and just automatically have it open in Safari on your on your iPad. And that was the, that was the whole reason why you hadn't moved over there. I was like, oh, man, that's kind of cool. Maybe I should start looking into this. And then out of nowhere, one day I'm on my phone and I'm on, you know, I'm on Safari. And then in my dock on the Mac, this pop open a Google Chrome and it says, you know, like import from your phone. From your phone so i click on that and it takes the page that it was actually on within the safari browser and opens it up in chrome I thought that was pretty cool i don't know when that feature came out but it's very useful it also shared your uh, your passwords too with your off. daughter at the same time is yeah. that what that happened oh, <laughs> man. so we didn't talk yeah so apparently chris had so for everyone listening i asked everyone i was like did you guys know like is this even a thing and i was looking around so my my daughter's phone she has like so for the the keychain. She has one hundred percent of any password ever used with with Mac, uh, whether it's on my phone, my desktop, or whatever. It's just, it's just all there. And if I make a change or delete, it's it just gets replicated in, instantly. So it's insane that that's actually going on. And uh, the only way to to do is actually to remove myself from the family, right? But it doesn't matter. Like there's there's some type of weird bug going on. So I need to open up a a, a bug with because that was back in twenty nineteen but it's still going on today. And there is no way within family sharing on Apple to share your passwords outside of like an airdrop or something like that. I can't remember what I was looking at, but it's, it's just wild. And out of the entire, uh, you know, six of us, it's just that one, to, one, one user in particular. And she had like credit cards. I mean, you name it, like it, it was all in there. It was, it's pretty wild. Wow. I just could have done a lot of damage there. I'd, I'd start a new profile to each. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> <laughs> just wipe your iCloud account and start from scratch. I pretty much did that, yeah. I, I mean, I use a different password manager for all of it. But by the way, uh, I did have a funny story for you guys all to share. And maybe we just make this like an NFT. But, uh, you know, uh, Kush, you haven't seen my wife, uh, but I, I perceive her to be a very attractive woman. And uh, so my entire life married to this woman, uh, when the kids come home from school, they're always saying, uh, you know, like a field trip or we went over there for lunch. It's like, Oh, you know, Mikey's got the hot mom or, you know, Ellie's got the hot mom. It's always about my wife. Is it? She's always <laughs> the hot mom. Right. And uh, so the other day <clears throat> we're going to the volleyball game for my, my youngest and we're getting into the car and my 13 year old goes, yeah, dad's known as the hot dad. I was like, finally, you know, like, all these <laughs> years drop. I've blossomed. <laughs> like, you know, like not that I want to be perceived as attractive to, you know, 13 year old girls, but you know, maybe, maybe I'm just maturing at this older age, right? Like I got this look and then like, but you know, the records, you know, screech, the jazz, the jazz music stopped. <laughs> And then uh, my daughter lay down. Yeah, all the boys are saying that. <laughs> what? So there you go. I'm the, I'm the hot dad, according to seventh grade boys, for some reason. <laughs> thirteen year old boys. Thirteen year old boys. You're the yeah. hot dad. Not not the way I thought this 
story was going to end. It's the facial hair, Brian. Totally. It must be. Yeah, <laughs> it's very rough. You got what you wanted, Brian. You said you're not aiming for 13 year old girls, so you didn't get 13 year old girls. <laughs> <laughs> you're right. You're right. You know, exactly. careful what you wish for. Glass half full. Uh, somewhere out there, I think the F. Not gonna lie, you had me in the first half. <laughs> <laughs> Somewhere out there, Brian's gonna get like a a investigation going on thirteen year old boys. So, well, no, I'm not. Yeah, I'm plausible sure deniability right here. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I'm airing it out. After this conversation, I'm pretty sure we're all on the watch list. Heard here on the podcast, episode <laughs> fifty three. <laughs> all right, and on that note. And on that note, we well, continue to get great comments about our dad joke of the week. Dad joke of the week. This week, our guest Kush is up. All right. So I just heard this one earlier today. What do you call a Soviet sniper? A marksman. Uh, what's that? <laughs> a marksman. <laughs> <laughs> Karl Marx. <laughs> uh, that's a good one. That's good. One. Wah, wah, it takes wah. a moment to say. <laughs> <laughs> like, what? <laughs> Nice. All right, to wrap things up, a lapis broke into Microsoft, NVIDIA, allegedly Okta, and Samsung as well. NVIDIA hacked back the lapis gang and encrypted their machines. The Italian government joins Have I Been Pwned. We're getting ready to pour one out for our old friend Internet Explorer. And 13-year-old boys find Brian highly attractive. Not That's dead. all we have for this week. We hope you enjoyed this week's episode. You can find us all on LinkedIn. Links will be in the description. Follow us on Instagram at Pebcag Podcast. Thank you to all our listeners and subscribers who rated us five stars in the iTunes store and Spotify and left us a review. We appreciate you all spreading the word to help grow the show. The best way to find us is to search for the Pebcag Podcast on your favorite podcast listening app. For my co-hosts, Brian Deach and Glenn Medina, and our guest Kush, I'm Chris Louie. Thanks for listening. We'll see you all next week. And as always, have a nice day. Have a good one, everyone. Take care. Kush, come back. Thanks, Kush. Love having you on. You got it. Yeah.